Hello, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to uh, another episode of um, this fabulous interview with our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. And uh, we've already began uh, the last couple of episodes to talk about some of the problems with the Quran. And today we are going to start basically uh, doing a more of a critical analysis of different areas of the Quran. First one we are going to address right now would be the two compilations of the Quran. Dr. J, welcome again. Well, good to be here again. Thanks so much. And uh, we've gone through introducing the six areas we were going to uh, be critical. Let's look at the two compilations, which we now have on the screen there. Now, remember, uh, this is, they claim it's a, an eternal book, uh, that it was complete by 632, the first recension, and then it was uh, another compilation that comes that's after right. that. And that's what we want to question in this episode. That's so right. how do we know this? Well, let's go back uh, to the material that all Muslims are dependent on. To understand how the Quran was put together, they need to go back to Al-Buhari. Who is Al-Buhari? Al-Bukhari, of course, is one of the, uh, you know, renowned collectors of hadith, and he's the first one to take all of the sayings of Muhammad. So he's the speaking. earliest compiler That's right. of That's right. the hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. That's right. Now, there are nine volumes in his collection today. We need to go back to volume number six, and we need to go back to hadith number 509 and 510. So let's look at volume six, starting with hadith number 509 that we have up on the screen there. And we have it both in Arabic and in English, so you can see it side by side. Correct. And then on the left, we're just going to summarize what they're saying, because other, it'll take us too much time to unpack all of it. The first one, 509, um, Abdul, Abdul says that between 632 and 634, that means right after Muhammad's death, Correct. you had the Caliph Abu Bakr realize that the text had uh, was not written down, and Buhari admits uh, that since many who memorize it had died, therefore a large part of the Quran may be lost. So that's already there in the text. A large part of the Quran may be lost. That's correct. Really, two years after Muhammad's death. Yeah. So th you can see that there is a question here. Uh, how, do, how much of it was is a large part? Zaid ibn Thabit. Now, this is the secretary of Muhammad. Uh, he, when he was given this responsibility to do it, he thought it was much too difficult to do so. Yeah, and the reason why um, is because... Uh, he feels a huge burden, and here's what he says, and I'm going to say it in Arabic first of all, meaning, why do you want to do something that the Prophet himself didn't do? Absolutely. Yeah. It just rolls out of your mouth. It's amazing <laughs> when you say it. I'd love to listen to that. But certainly you can see that he is saying, listen, even our Prophet couldn't do this, and you're asking me to do it? That's right. So you can see there is some question as to what's the wisdom in this. We move on, and Zaid ibn Thabit again, he finally agrees to do so, and so what does he do? He looks he, to find verses that are collected on palm stalks, on stones, and the memories of the surviving warriors. In, case, in one case, he only found it with one person, and that's chapter 9, verse 128 and 129, the vast two verses of chapter 9. So it's fascinating that he had to look at these places to find it. It's not written down. Obviously, it's therefore not written down. And when Muslims try to come back and say, yes, it was written down in the time of Muhammad, they need to look and ask, look, even your own sources are very clear. It was not written down. That's correct. And it would be a problem for Zaid ibn Thabit because even the Prophet had not done this. Not only that, but Omar admits that the idea of preserving it in memory is not really a valid idea because he was afraid that they're going to lose the Quran. Obviously. So right there when Muslims, and they, they do come back, say, we don't care. It doesn't need to be written down. It was memorized. Not according to Abu Bakr and not according to Umar. They realized that this had to be written down. That's right. Because what happens to one's memory? It fades away. And uh, once you transmit something after a while, after a period of time, things begin to change. Some details are not the, the same anymore. Absolutely. I, now, even what we're saying today, if we were to have all the people who are watching this video, and if they were to go back and try to just, the, uh, we've only taken five minutes, just what we've said in the first five minutes. If we were to ask the people who were listening to, to write down what we have just said, you can imagine there would be as many people that wrote it down, there'd be that many different renditions. That's right. 50 people write it down, you get 50 different renditions of what we've said. That's the problem with memory. Memory, you only pick and choose what you remember. Uh, we, I, I, there's this great, there, there's this great uh, um, kids game that you, we play in birthday parties called Chinese Whispers. When you tell one person something, they tell the next and the next and the next. Right. By the time it gets to the 15th or 16th person, what you start with and what you end with are two different things. It's a great game. And that can happen within a period of 10 minutes. Can you imagine what would happen in this case over years 
that you've, in this case, you can see we're going to talk about 20 years, it would change immensely. So they had to write it down. It's obvious they needed to write it down. That's correct. Now, you have uh, the first compilation. This is the first recension. was first given to Abu Bakr, and then it was given to Umar, who is the second caliph, and then it was given to his daughter, who is Hafsa. She used to be one of the wives, one of the 12 wives of Muhammad. That's correct. Now, she, that was retained then uh, for about the first 20 years. That's hadith number five of nine. Now we sk skip to hadith number 510. Let's look at the slide there. In the 510 now, we've now jumped 20 years because now we're at the time of Uthman. Abu Bakr has died. Umar was killed. Uthman now is now the caliph and uh, he became the caliph in 646. Now we're roughly now 650, 652. So we're about five years to seven years into his reign. You have a second problem. And it says right there that Hudaifa comes to him, and he's afraid that the people in Syria and Iraq uh, would have different recitations of the Quran. So he's asking Uthman uh, to have the Quran written down a second time, to rewrite the Quran using Hafsa's first compilation, that first compilation that was given to Hafsa. That's correct. Now, do you see a problem with that? Absolutely. I tell you what's the problem is he, obviously, Uthman, didn't trust the first copy that was made. He realized there are more copies that are circling around, and he... Okay, right there. More copies. Yeah, needed to so centralize already, that. already, there's admission that there are different Qurans. That's correct. This is an admission, huge admission. Why don't Muslims pick this up? Because uh, they only emotionally want to hear what they want to hear. This is their material. We're not making this up. And you can see we've kept the Arabic there. We've kept the English literal translation. And we're just summarizing what is already there. On That's the right. right side of the screen, we're summarizing on the left. That's correct. So you've got some problems here. This is already admission that there were maybe different Qurans. In Syria and Iraq, there are different Qurans. That's correct. So at the very center of Islam, you're getting different manuscripts, different codices, re, re, admission of that. So Uthman orders four compilers, Zaidi, Mithabit, Zubair, Alas, and Hisham, to rewrite the text. Why do you need to rewrite the text if you've got it right there in Hafsa's copy? And in fact, he asked him to bring that as one of those copies they want to review, but they ended up rewriting it, and as you know, Uthman decided on a certain dialect. Now, here's the central question. I thought there were seven different readings of the Quran. Why would Uthman settle on one? Why not seven different reading copies? Okay, now let's back that up. Hold on a minute. Say that again. There were seven different akhruf or kiryat. That's what the Islamic tradition is based on a hadith that was written 200 plus years after the time of Muhammad. If that was true, why did Uthman decide on one dialect only? Aha, uh -huh. and what about the other six? Supposedly he burned them. Okay, second, we're gonna, we haven't got to that yet. Hold on, you've jumped a gun on me on this one. Mm -hmm. But before we even get into that, let me ask you, as an Arabist, this is your scholar, you're the, you're the Arabist, you're, uh, you know what a dialectic difference is. How do you find dialectic difference in a consonantal text? Well, you only find it when you have diacritical markings. And diacritical markings are what? Those are the markations you put above or below letters to help you vocalize and pronounce words. You said that on a previous episode. That's right. In a future episode, we're going to actually show you. We're going to show you on slides what happens when you put the different dots That's in. That's right. So you have to have diacritical marks to separate the letters one from the other to know which letter you're looking at. That's correct. You can have just a little shape like this, a little bowl shape, a smiley face. One dot is a na, two dot is a ta, three dot is a tha, one dot below is a ba, two dots is ya, na, ta, tha, ba, ya. That's five different letters That's right. from de depending on where you put the dots. But the only problem is Uthman didn't even use that. Oh, wait a minute. I th So there were no dots? Nothing. At you this can, time? You can look at the copies, at least the early Quranic copies that would date to uh, before or after Uthman, and they still don't have marks it. didn't exist in the 7th century. They did not. It took about 100 to 150 <laughs> years so for the what system to be developed. is Uthman saying here? He's, this doesn't make sense. Exactly. He's going just by the oral way of saying it. That's I'm going to even dispute that. that he, he's, he's not even saying this. Well, that's at least what the hadith will insinuate. As and if when it was, was the hadith written? When was this 200 particular? 200 years after. 240 years. That's right. The be date, exact. Yeah. The date uh, we're talking about, the, the, the date we're looking at uh, is 870. Muhammad died in 632. That's right. So you're talking about 240 years later. 870 is when Bukhari died. So just before he died, he's writing this. Now, by the time 870 comes into play, we're talking about the late 9th century, where are their diacritical marks? Uh, right now, they are uh, starting to be available. Yes. They were all there. Yes. 
By age 70, yes, Buhari knows what he's talking about. But he's talking about his day. That's correct. This is a problem that would have existed in his day, these dialectic differences. So he is, basically, he's redacting on what he thinks must have been happening. He's redacting it back to the 7th century. He didn't know his own history. That's Probably right. because he didn't look at the earliest manuscripts like we are able to do today. So you can see immediately this is a 9th century problem redacted onto a 7th century environment. That's correct. And Muslims, you need to hear this because you hear this argument from Muslims all the time. Oh, no, these were seven ahruf. That, by, uh, by definition of ahruf, you have to have diacritical marks to show the different ahruf. That's correct. That's so correct. in a consonantal text which has no dots, has no vowelization, no dhamma, no kasar, no fatah, You're left to read those hadn't been invented want. yet in the mid-7th century. None of this makes sense. Absolutely. Oh, that's, I love that's this. That's a good point. Now, we need to make sure that we underline this. And I hope Muslims especially are listening to this because these are the claims your leaders make. These are the claims your, uh, your pundits make. And yet they don't make sense historically. We're doing historical critiques here. Let's move on. So therefore, he has these four rewrited in a, te- in a dialect that didn't even exist, at least not in a written form. That's you could correct. have had a dialectic to, in Orally, yes, there was a dialectic difference, but not in a written text. Ooh, I love that. So... We get down to Uthman, then sends a copy to of, of, of this finalized Quran that is different than all the other ones. He sends a copy to nine cities, and we've got the cities listed up there. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. Those are the nine cities. We know, how do we know that? Because there were to every province, it says in the text. That's correct. Yeah. We know there were nine provinces. So one copy of this finalized, canonized Quran, perfect Quran, were sent to nine cities. With every copy went a reader. And I want to add this. The fact that there were no diacritical markings back then in the days of Uthman. So one will say the only concern Uthman has is the resm that he used, which is the... Now you said shape, Arabic word there. Define what yeah, you which mean. Which is the shape of the words and the letters. Whatever words he used... He was disagreeing with other copies that have different words, and now we have the Sana'a manuscript to even prove things like this. Okay, we're going to get to that. You're now really jumping ahead because I can see you're, wit- you're getting at the bit. You want to get ahead. You want to get to the conclusion, but we still need to lay a foundation. We need to say, lay a base for what's happening That's here. That's correct. So he sent to nine different provinces. Those are the nine. Where are they? Ooh, two, 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 two. million dollar question. Let me think this like a Muslim. In the room. A Muslim going to come back and tell you, oh, it's in Samarkand. It's okay. in top copy. Please do. And I <laughs> hope you Muslims who are listening, you do come back on us because we're that's going to be the next episode. We're going to go into those that do exist. But no, Absolutely. no, we're looking for nine. We're not looking for four anymore that's like we correct. always thought. We're looking for nine. All right. Now, uh, cont- uh, t- we continues on with Al-Buhari, uh, volume 6, 5, 10. Now, once he sends the copies of this second compilation, a second rendition, a second different Quran. Otherwise, why would you need to rewrite it? Obviously, it's different than the first one. That's correct. So a second compilation, a second Quran, written 20 years after Muhammad's death. Muhammad wasn't even there to see whether it was the same. He's been dead for 20 years. He then orders that all the Quranic materials, either fragmentary manuscripts or whole manuscripts, be burnt. Ooh, two, 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 two. Help me here. Come on, Al. That's another proof that he did not like the way the others were written because there are different words that were there than the copy he made. You're only The only reason you would ever burn anything is to destroy the evidence. That's correct. And what evidence would you want to destroy? Anything disagrees with your final copy. This is his final copy. He wants his name to go to it, and it is. To even today, they call it the Uthman and Crescentia. That's correct. He wants his, this to be his final copy, and he wants to destroy anything else that doesn't agree with it. Absolutely. proving that this has nothing to do with Muhammad. Muhammad wasn't there. This has nothing to do with God. And, and the question is, who authorized Uthman in the first place to do something like this? And how do we know that Uthman's copy, of uh, created 20 years later by these four individuals, is anything like the one that's in heaven? That's correct. Why didn't Uthman, for instance, use the Hafsa copy, which was uh, even written closer to the time of Muhammad? Million dollar question. I would like to know what they did to Hafsa's copy. That's what right. happened to it? most likely it was destroyed as well. <laughs> oh, dear. It just gets worse and worse as we go along. Now, you don't destroy copies unless you want to destroy the evidence. Wouldn't it be great if we had everything that was burned to look at? 
wouldn't it have been great if they had preserved those burn, those burn items so we could at least put it together and forensically try to find what was different in any of that? And you know, Dr. J, here is what I wonder about. Why do Muslims get upset when the Quran is burned today when, in fact, their kale have burned Qurans? At the very beginning. They exactly. need to look at that. And we're, everything we're saying right now is from... Al Buhari, right Volume here. Six, it's right here, Hadith ladies and gentlemen. Look at fact, it. We're we not have it this on up. the screen. There you go. Now let's move on. So, here are the questions I have. Question number one, and we can go on the screen. Let's take a look at them. Why did God, first of all, use a language which could not accommodate the Quran? You've mm -hmm. already told me Absolutely. that the that the seventh century Arabic script only used Razm. Correct. He already had other languages. God had already used Hebrew and Greek. With Absolutely. the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were lots of languages that were quite sophisticated, could have easily accommodated it. Why did not God use those languages to begin with? Because the Arabic is limited to a small area, geographical area, and a small group of people. So how can the Quran be a message for all people? Not only that, we know that the Arabic is a very new language. Uh, we don't have any reference to Arabic prior to the second century AD. Correct. And we know that it's derived out of the Nabataean script. That's the correct. Nabataeans, as we're going to find out later on, were very significant in what we know as Islam today. But that's for another video at another time. Nonetheless, we do know that it was crude. It was so crude, it could not even, you could not even understand it that early. Now, in God's wisdom, I don't understand why he would have chosen this language. Secondly, why did he choose a man who could not read or write? And that's another puzzling question because the first revelation, as we mentioned earlier, uh, that he received says, read. What does that mean? Akra. If he doesn't know how to read, why would God even start his revelation that's to this man? That's the first man? thing Gabriel said to him exactly. when he hit a cave. Akra. And what was his response? I do not know what to read. Ma akra. I cannot read. Well, that should have told Gabriel, Matt, okay, you got the wrong guy here. He says, you know? Go somewhere else. Obviously, this guy cannot, cannot be the arbiter for the greatest revelation for the, uh, in the history of mankind. If he cannot read, and that was his one goal, that was his one mission, why in the world did Gabriel still stay there with him and say it three times? Three times, squeezing him after each time, yeah, according correct. to the tradition again. That's correct. By that time, it should have been pretty clear that you've got the wrong man. Go get a guy who can read, a guy who can write. And because that is what his only responsibility is to write this revelation down, to pr preserve it. Now, that was his only remit. Secondly, even if he, they still said, okay, we'll give him some more time. You know, of course, he can't read. Why didn't he learn to read? He had 22 years. And uh, that was his language. Uh, it's not like something new anyway. Listen, when I learned Arabic in London, it took me two weeks to learn the Arabic script, to read and write it. Not to, I didn't know what I was reading or writing. I didn't know Arabic. Muhammad did know Arabic. That's right. If it, can, uh, if it only took me two weeks to read and write the Arabic script, why in 20 years, 22 years, could he not do so? That's another puzzling question, of course. And then hold on a minute. Didn't he have a scribe? He did. Didn't he have Zaid ibn Thabit? At least more than once, but Zaid was one of them. What do scribes do? What's their remit? What's their one responsibility a secretary is supposed to do? To write. That's right. So why would, didn't he give him the, the other authority or the responsibility to write it down? The whole time he was with them, wouldn't it be something that he should have done? Wouldn't that be something that should have been preserved? That's correct. So and when we do have to, like Ubay and, and, uh, and uh, um, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, they both took it upon themselves to write their own. No one go. told them. There you go. And then why didn't Abu Bakr make copies immediately of that which he wrote down? That's why correct. did he just give it to one copy and give it to one woman? Shouldn't there have been many copies made, like Uthman made nine copies? Where are the copies that Abu Bakr made? That's rather irresponsible of him. And obviously he let basically uh, this idea continue because many took upon themselves to keep writing and writing and writing. We have later that many different Qurans, of course. And then we brought this already up. Uh, this is the third set of questions, and that is, how could there be dialectical differences in the seventh century these, these dialects, by definition, require diacritical marks. They require vowelization. That was not introduced until the 8th century. They were not finalized until the 9th century. Uh, and that's, you can see why al-Buhari would have known about them, but not, certainly not the time of the 7th century or the 8th century. Because he was reading backward from his days. That's right. He was redacting it back, that view. And then, of course, as we already mentioned, why in the world would you burn something that was God's holy word, God's eternal word, the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, unless, of course, 
there was discrepancies. Mm-hmm. Well, now, D- Dr. J, this is great material. Is there anything else we want to add to this before maybe we wrap it up so we can come back again with another topic in our list? Well, I want to look, before we finish the compilations, I want to look at what the traditions say, because the traditions also go into this. They make some troubling, they give us some troubling views. This is the Islamic tradition. That's the sira of the Prophet Muhammad. That means the sira to Rasulullah, which would be the, the biography, biography of the Prophet Muhammad. That's correct. First written by Ibn Hisham and, and Al-Wikiri. Then you have the hadith that we've already referred to by Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tirmidhi, and the others. And then you have the tafsir first compiled by Al-Tabari in 923. That's right. Uh, and then those are the uh, um, so exegesis of uh, it. And then you have the tah, uh, the um, ta, history, tarikh. history tarikh. tarikh. So you have the yes. ta, hi, sira, hadith, Tafsir in Tahi, those four genres, that's the note as the Islamic traditions. That's right. So let's look and unpack and see what they say concerning how the Quran was compiled. Because what you're going to find is pretty disturbing, or in our case, pretty exciting. Let's start with them and let's put them up on the screen. There's yes. Al-Buhari, Al-Hajjaj, Ibn Dawud, al tirmidhi Al-Nasai, Ibn Majah, and then some would put a seventh one. Uh, yeah, Ibn, Ibn Malik. Okay, Ibn so Malik. those are really the six to seven authoritative hadith compilers. And what, look and see what they say. So the first one by Ibn Daud, what does he say? He's saying many of the passages of the Quran uh, that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. He's talking about that, that battle. And they were not known by those who survived them, which means they were lost. That's so many were not known. So we did lose quite a few. So this is a huge admission. That's right. Nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. That's a huge admission right there by That's Ibn right. Dawud. So he's already saying that good bit, a lot of it was lost. And here's another one about disappeared. Go ahead and read that one. That's this is by, uh, by Sayyuti. Yeah, let's come to Ulum al-Quran. He's one of the renowned uh, tafsir, basically scholars. It is reported, he says, from Ishmael ibn Ibrahim, from Ayyub, from uh, Nafi, uh, from Ibn Umar, and then he goes on to say, let none of you say, that's Ibn Omar saying this, Ib, the son of the Caliph Omar is saying this, let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran, he says. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Oh dear. This is the son of the Caliph who <laughs> lived with, at the time of Muhammad. Rather let us say, I have acquired what has survived. Why is it Muslims aren't reading this? I, I find it that uh, uh, amusing to me because the early Muslims were really transparent and they were not thinking about the Quran as a rigid text. They never make the claims Muslims today are That's making. Right. So it's obvious you need to go back. We're just reading their traditions. Let's go on to another one. Here are some verses were forgotten. And this one has to do with the uh, basically memorization, of course, what we used uh, to recite a surah which resembles in length and severity to Surah uh, Bara, uh, which is uh, chapter 9. I have, however, he said, forgotten it, with the exception. And then he goes on and says what the exception is. Exactly. So here he's admitting that he has forgotten it. That's right. And here we have some verses were canceled against Sahih Buhari. Now, hold on. Sahih Buhari is the most authoritative because Sahih means perfect. So this is the greatest of all the Hadith compilers. What does he say? And here's what Bukhari is saying. He said, we, uh, he's reporting here, someone saying, we used to read a verse uh, of the Quran revealed in their connection, but later the verse was canceled. It was conveyed to our people on our behalf, the information that we have met uh, our Lord. And canceled. Then, Al-Bukhari is admitting that parts of it have been canceled. And this verse doesn't exist. <laughs> now let's continue with Al-Bukhari because he said that some verses were missing. And this is the great verse on Rajam. Go ahead and read this. I mean, basically, we know that the stoning verse doesn't exist in the Quran, yet stoning is practiced under Sharia law. So it's referring to Surah 24, Ayah 2. In chapter 24, verse 2, it says 100 lashes. But here you have Umar, who is really upset because he says, we used to stone, the Prophet used to stone after us, but I'm afraid that when they read the Quran today, they won't find that verse there. That's right. He's admitting that that verse has been taken out. And this is one of Muhammad's closest companions who became the second caliph. There you go. Huge admission here. Let's continue on. So, overlooked. This is Ab- uh, Ibn Abi Dawid again. What does he say? Uh, Ibn Abi Dawid saying, Khuzayma ibn Thabit says, I see you have overlooked. Notice, overlooked two verses and have not written them. And they said, this is and what then they are. he began to report it. So you can read that for yourself. So there you have him saying that they have been overlooked. And now we come back to, to Iman Malik, the, the seventh uh, major of the compilers, uh, concerning Aisha. This is the wife of Muhammad. What does he say about Aisha? 
Uh, here's what it's saying. It's saying Abu uh, Abu uh, Unus, freed man of Aisha, basically he was like basically a slave, uh, mother of the believers reported, Aisha ordered me to transcribe the Holy Quran and ask me to let her know when I should arrive at the verse, Havadu uh, 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 Salat al-Asr, basically. He's talking about the uh, third, Chapter 2, verse 238. Third, yeah. Yeah, was Salati, uh, and uh, he was talking about chapter 2, verse 238. And he says, when I arrived at that verse, basically, I informed her, and she ordered, write it in this way. So here she is telling him to write it a different way than he has memorized it. So here is a woman, wife of the prophet, who is actually correcting and changing the Quran. I didn't know women could change the Quran, did you? Well, but there uh, it is. Imam Malik refers to that reference. If you ask my Muslim friends, uh, why did Muhammad marry Aisha when she was young? They say, oh, it was by God's grace and wisdom so that she can learn from the Prophet. Well, there you have it. There <laughs> is is, a, a, and now she's changing what the Prophet had right. said earlier, if yeah. that had happened. Now, yeah. we come to another one that was modified, and this is by uh, the Hadith Ibn Abidar. What, what does he say? He's saying, um, altogether, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, that's another now prominent this, name, now, by Abba, the way. He is the, he is, uh, the governor of Kufa that's under right. Abdul Malik. That's right. He lived in there. So we're he, talking he even late made modifications century, and redactions of the Quran century. himself. Okay, what is it yeah. and what happened? He's saying he made 11 modifications in the reading of the Uthmanic text. He changed the Uthmanic text. 11 times. So that's an enormous admission right there. That's right. Now we get to verse, some verses were substituted. Sahih Buhari again. And here it's saying, but Allah says, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Now that's in chapter 2, verse 106. That's so right. that's in the Quran itself. Exactly. You can also find in 16, Ayah 101. That's the correct. The exact same thing. So two references to changing the verse or substituting a verse. Uh, now we end with this one by, by Sunan Ibn Majah. What did he talk about? Eating it. Now that's an embarrassing one, of course, and it says it was narrated that Aisha, once again, said the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came and ate it. It ate it, okay. Now, just a review. Lost, disappeared, forgotten, cancelled. Missing, overlooked, changed, modified, substituted, eaten by sheep. Now tell me, Al Fari, does this sound like a book which was compiled perfectly and completely? It's very obvious that that's not the case, and it's very obvious that the early Muslims in those days did not even look at it as something rigid that you have to fight over. And in every case, these are intentional changes by humans. Absolutely. And this is what we're trying to prove. All these episodes, we're trying to show that this book does not come from heaven. It does not come from Muhammad. It doesn't even come from Uthman. These are later changes, and some of these are changes before Uthman. Some come after Uthman. But you can see we're talking about human intentional changes. Absolutely. And as you can see, I mean, these changes were done after the death of Muhammad. It wasn't done even during his life. It was done later. So who's the author of the Quran in this case? Don't tell me Muhammad reported a message from heaven because we know already it's Uthman, it's Aisha, and it's many others who authored parts of the Quran and changed it. And even a sheep. That's right. Well, I hope um, uh, if you're watching, uh, you've enjoyed this show. And please uh, continue to basically follow uh, this series because we will be publishing these videos one by one and we'll continue to talk about the different problems of the Quran, among many other topics that we will be doing with our dear brother, Uh, Dr. J. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.